I'm so excited to be here and um, explore some possibility spaces with you all. Um, when I was first invited to come and speak at the conference, they asked me to be kind of the resident futurist, but you know, actually I hate that term. I, it kind of like evokes this, somebody in like some room somewhere who has some special magic powers. I actually prefer the term future curious. <laughs> uh, and I know I'm in a room full of future curious people and you're all in the process of imagining new futures. So I see you as peers. Um, I'm gonna share, I know this word has come up quite a bit today, but it's an important one. I'm hoping to share some stories about not only how, who I am and how I got here, but maybe some, uh, also some uh, the work that we're doing in our research around uh, generative AI, um, so maybe some ideas you haven't heard, uh, and some new techniques for using it to develop your own stories. So just to start off, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Going back to the 1970s, I was the child of two artists in Boston, Massachusetts. That's me in the middle. Uh, and two parents that taught me a lot about uh, exploring possibilities in the world and communicating around that. At the same time, in Boston, there was a, an inventor named Ray Kurzweil, who was a, a kind of wonderkind uh, pattern recognition expert from MIT, who developed, uh, using uh, uh, early forms of machine intelligence, the first reading machine for the blind and was able to put, uh, you were able to put a book on top and it would be used optical character recognition uh, and speak it out loud. Now of course today that seems pretty primitive, right? But at, the, at that time in the 1970s, that was a breakthrough, especially if you were blind and could only have things read to you. Uh, so I got, my dad actually started working at that company um, and I got a chance to try out this reading machine for the blind. I got to put books on it and have it read to me and it not only blew my mind what it could do but I got early ex um, exposure to one of the world's most innovative inventors and futurists. Jump 30 years into the future and I actually ended up working with Ray Kurzweil. Um, I worked on uh, a project at TED in 2000 where Ray had a crazy idea of wanting to show people this idea, this idea of virtual reality, which was very new at the time, and the idea that you could become anybody you want in virtual reality. So myself and a couple other uh, technical experts transformed Ray into a female virtual rage rock singer, and he performed on TED back in the day. Um, you, this is before TED was a public event, so you actually can't see it on the TED.com. Um, and it just so happens that's how, why I'm here today, because that, brought me to, that project brought me to the Bay Area. I was living in Boston, and that's when I met Thor and Amy, some of my first closest friends in the Bay Area who welcomed me there. So that's how I ended up here. Now, Ray went on to publish a book that was a New York Times bestseller called Singularity is Near that really, back in 2005, introduced the world to this idea of exponential technological growth the idea that our brains are wired to see things linearly, so it's hard for us to understand when things change exponentially. Um, and of course, you know, uh, that now that's become a whole kind of whole world of it itself, and this, the idea of the singularity, it was a term borrowed from astrophysics. Uh, uh, astrophysics. The idea, it's a, something that's such a different paradigm that it's impossible for us to understand because it's so different, a singularity. I ended up actually directing a documentary film with Ray about the book where we interviewed a lot of the folks, so kind of helping to build this world. And then uh, that introduced me to the world of futures work. And then in 2016, I joined uh, Institute for the Future, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a moment. And I started a lab there called the Emerging Media Lab. Um, that was my first day there. I always remember exactly when it was is because the week after I joined IFTF, Trump was elected and the future changed very dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> the possibilities. Uh, just one more piece of backstory. So when I joined IFTF, I've been there for eight years now, and um, I've been learning a lot about futures work. Um, I've always been a bit of a futurist on my own, but I've learned world-class methodologies now and work with some of the top futures thinkers in the world. Um, and I've developed my own, kind of evolved my own philosophy. Um, if you're interested in driving to a rabbit hole, this is a talk I have online called From the Singularity to the Multiverse. And what it really is is a response to the idea that for many years, the idea of the singularity has kind of been the dominant mythology of the future, right? And it's one that's very based in this idea of a monolithic future, the future. And it's gonna be technologically driven and we're gonna control the world. We're literally gonna live forever. 
right? So I, I explore in this talk a little bit the idea of multiversal futures, uh, the idea that we need to think more pluralistically, more dynamically, um, and that ultimately the, there is no the future. There's actually, even as we move into the future, we're all living in our own universe of that future. We need to be doing futures thinking that anticipates and accounts for that. Okay, so a little bit about IFTF, Institute for the Future. We are a nonprofit uh, independent research organization based in Palo Alto, California. And we don't believe anybody can predict the future, but we do believe that it's important to think creatively and strategically about it. Our biggest challenge, though, is that human brains are not wired to think about the future. Our brains are mostly wired to think about everything we've experienced in the past. We've modeled how the world works, and we project that into the present, and we, in fact, pr project that into the future. And that works really well for things that are, you know, like anticipating the sun will rise tomorrow, or knowing if I drop a hammer, it'll probably fall, and if it falls on my foot, it'll, it'll probably hurt, right? It's how we learn, it's how we model the world. But when the world is changing, it doesn't always serve us. So everybody wishes they had a crystal ball, and I'm gonna share a secret as a professional futurist about thinking about the future. No one can predict the future. Don't believe anybody that tells you they can, especially if they're from Silicon Valley. <laughs> so at IFTF, we prefer the term future ready, and actually the previous presentation was an excellent example of future readiness, right? Anticipating possible changes and uh, how you might adjust to those futures and adapt and advocate for the futures you're looking for. And we work with large organizations, government agencies all around the world helping them to do this. And we've actually been doing this for a long time. IFTF was founded back in 1968 by some of the original computer and social scientists working on the ARPANET which we now call the internet. Back then, you can see there was only four nodes on the entire internet. And these computer and social scientists were looking at this, and at the time it was just a military and an academic project, and it was just for you know, computer scientists. And they said, wait a minute, what if this distributed communication network, what if everybody had this? What if everybody could communicate in real time and share information anywhere in the world? That might change where the future is going to be. And of course, that's essentially what has happened. And since that time, IFTF has been helping the world kind of anticipate a range of possible and ideally preferable futures and been thinking a lot about in the impacts of technological change. So we have a number of different labs at IFTF looking at everything from the future of food, future of governance. Our director runs the Equitable Futures Lab. My lab is the Emerging Media Lab, and I like to say we're focused on the future of human communication and collaboration and connection through the lens of emerging media technologies and the lens of emerging media mythologies. Not just what are the tools, but what are the new stories we can tell that we couldn't tell before? What are the new conversations we can have that we can't, couldn't have before? And probably most importantly, who's going to be telling those stories and who's going to be in those conversations? So there's a new media technology on the horizon, right, that's rapidly becoming the elephant in many, many, many rooms. Um, as it, uh, you know, it's a general purpose technology, I like to say generative AI will only touch your world if you deal with words, images, sound, or video. <laughs> but it's a very difficult thing to grasp, right? Um, I, I, I like to bring up this topic, or sorry, this, uh, the, the parable of the five blind people with the elephant. You might have noticed that there's a lot of different opinions and even ideas about gender of AI, and some of them quite conflicting, right? And I would say that this is in large part because this is a, such a large, you know, general purpose technology that has so many different impacts that we can all only understand it from our own touch points. So just like with the elephant, some people are looking at this and saying, generative AI is this very articulate, you know, capable trunk. It can do anything. Other people are saying, oh, well, be careful. It's very sharp and pointy. It's like a tusk. Other people are still saying, hey, stay away from it. It's a stinky tail, right? Um, and in many ways, they're all right. And, and one of the challenges we have, actually, let me go back. The other challenge we have is that even just even throughout this conference, we keep talking about NAI, AI, monolithically, 
right? Imagine if we talked about you know, computers that way. Computers, of course, have many, many different expressions. So AI, there's many different types of AI. Um, and in fact, you know, a lot of the AI that we've been using for the last 10 years has been what I would call classification AI. It's, been when, it's what's been curating our social media feeds, recommending movies to us on Netflix, helping our search queries, maybe even identifying you know, coral photos and those kinds of things, classifying. Generative AI is showing up in our lives in the form of things like chatbots, image generators, and it's even starting to make some pretty amazing scientific discoveries like AlphaFold. So you can think of classification AI as pattern recognition, right? And both of these types of AI are a form of machine learning. And the real simplistic example of this is, let's say you have a pile of photos of cats and dogs, and you want to sort, and you pass it through what we call a neural network, and it's able to classify the cats and the dogs. Generative AI, you can think of more as pattern completion. Right? So um, you might put in a sentence like, the garden was full of a beautiful, and it might say flowers, it might say trees, herbs, bugs. Um, and it can complete that pattern. It's making new data, right? And one of the interesting things you can see here is that it might say something different each time. And that's something very different, not only from other forms of AI, but most technology that we know, right? And one of the key things about generative AI that's hard to grasp and we need to develop new intuitions around is that it's non-deterministic, okay? What that means is you can put in, you might get a different result each time, even though you put the same in, the inputs in. So imagine a calculator that you put two plus two and it said something different each time. It's counter to our intuitions around technology, but it's very important to understand this. And because of that, generative AI hallucinates. So you might ask it a question like, what's the world record for crossing the English Channel entirely on foot? You might get an answer. You know, it's kind of an absurd question, right? You get an answer like, you know, the, the, it's held, uh, held by the specific person, exact time, on exact date. It sounds like a real answer, right? And it's confident in its answer. And that's actually an old example. Companies are desperately trying to get rid of these hallucinations, but just even from a couple months ago, Google launched their new AI overview, and someone was asking, are parachutes effective? And it said, parachutes are no more effective than backpacks at preventing death or major injury when from an aircraft. <laughs> And we're laughing at that, right? But that can have severe consequences. Recently, some books on Amazon were found that were mushroom identification books that were AI generated and people are getting poisoned. So there can be some high stakes here beyond just a funny, funny little response. Now this is something I, you're not gonna hear the big AI companies telling you, but it's really important to understand Generative AI is not designed to, to, to generate answers. It's designed to generate things that sound like answers. And the problem with that is a lot of things that sound like answers are correct answers. And the ones that are not correct also sound like answers, right? So you can see. And companies across the board, as a, they're racing to build information retrieval systems and handle all their decision and information communication systems, companies across the world are discovering this the hard way. So a lot of people are asking, okay, is this generative AI even actually intelligent? And we could debate that for many hours, and, and I'm happy to do that later at the party tonight. Um, but I would say, you know, first of all, artificial intelligence is a terrible term. It was invented in the 1950s. It's kind of like horseless carriage. Um, and also it implies, you know, when we hear at in, uh, artificial intelligence, we think precision intelligence, right? It's very misleading. And the other thing that artificial says to us is replacing human intelligence. And I think that's the wrong model. I think, as we've seen other examples throughout this weekend, we should be looking at this as augmenting human intelligence, right? In which we still have a role, not only because, not just a job, but it's actually a very important role because as we've seen, these systems aren't always dependable. So I'm gonna share a little um, 
a little experience from a class that I teach at IFTF, um, and it's about providing some hands-on literacies with these tools, and I think that's really important to develop those new intuitions. Um, so this is a class called Three Horizons of AI. I'm one of the instructors, and it basically is looking at near, mid, and long-term futures, generative AI, and it's looking at how can we use foresight uh, methodologies to anticipate the impacts on your organization. And I just want to put a little disclaimer here right off the bat that the use of generative AI systems, this is not an endorsement of generative AI systems. This is, this is research. I'm exploring these tools. There are many unresolved technical, legal, and ethical issues around generative AI. In fact, I have uh, colleagues at the Institute for the Future that refuse to use it on ethical basis. But I do believe personally that it's very important if you want to have critical assessments, you need to have nuanced understanding. And there's a lot of misconceptions around generative AI and a lot of speculation. And I believe in the process of what I call design research, learning by making and using the tools. So it's a big part of why I encourage folks not just to get empowered, but also to learn about what, it can, what they can do and what they can't do. So I don't have time to go through all these, but in the course we kind of outline what, what uh, generative AI is capable of doing, what it's not so great at doing. One of the things I like to point out, though, is we're less inventing generative AI than we are discovering it. The people, even the people who have making generative AI don't fully understand how it works um, because it's not written through instructions. It's a, it's a process of machine learning in which we feed it a bunch of data, and then we get this neural network, and it seems we put information in, it seems to put out useful information on the other side, sometimes. But just to you know, kind of cover, quickly go through this, it's great at natural language processing, it's great for ideation, people are using it for code, you can even do it for data analysis, you can generate now increasingly multimodal models where you can generate images, video, audio, 3D. But the things not to use it for, never assume it's factually, conceptually, or ethically correct. And know that the training data is biased, right? And we don't always know what the training data was for these models. Never use it as a replacement for creativity, but, also, but you can use it as a part of your creative process. The one slide I slipped, skipped over in my personal history is I actually uh, started in the, the digital media age back when the first computers were being used to make movies. And I remember people saying, you'll never make a real movie with a computer. People are saying the same thing now. You'll never make real art. Well, yeah, I mean, I can understand there's a lot of, again, ethical issues around this, but these are tools. These are, this is a medium, right? We haven't yet figured out how to use it. Um, also, don't use it as a decision maker. You can use it as input to human process, and I'm gonna demonstrate that in a moment. Um, it always requires review, auditing, editing, and there's big issues of accountability, right? Who's gonna be accountable for the mistakes this thing, things, these things are making? And just don't use it for high stakes applications. If you look at the bottom in very small fine print underneath the chat GPT uh, text entry, it'll say like, do not depend on the answers from this, <laughs> but it's very small print. Okay, so just at a high level, one of the things that we like to say at Institute for the Future is generative AI is not a reliable answer finder, but it's an unprecedented possibility explorer. And that's very valuable, especially for strategic foresight practitioners like myself. Um, and this is something called a futures cone. It's kind of a classic diagram in futures work. And if you imagine ourselves here right now, you know, the kind of natural tendency is just to only anticipate the projected future. A large part of our role as futurists is to help people expand this futures cone, right? Not only to the, the probable future or the plausible future or even the widest possibility, but all the way out to the most preposterous future. In fact, one of the leading kind of thinkers in futures work, Jim Dater, said any useful idea at first may sound ridiculous. And the reason is, why the reason we need to go out to the preposterous is that really what our goal is here is to find the preferable futures. And until you've expanded out your, co your cone, you're leaving a lot of those outside of your view. Um, 
I teach a class, I teach one of our classes in strategic foresight methodology. It's a three-day class. I'll give you the very short version. Um, we deal in forecasts and scenarios. And forecasts in strategic foresight is diff are different than a quantitative forecast from a weather forecaster or even a financial forecaster. With our work, forecasts are provocative and plausible statements about the future designed to surface insights in the present, not predictions again. This is about generating conversation so you can explore what, what your possible points of action are. So forecasts are kind of the descriptive statements about the future. Scenarios are the speculative storytelling that brings those forecasts to life, right? And reveals the nuances and perspectives of what it's like to be in that future, right? Not just describing it from the 10,000 foot view, but what's it like to be in that future as a, as a human being or operate in that future as an organization. So we generated a framework for the class um, that is kind of demonstration of how to use generative AI in this process as a human AI collaboration. And it's a, we've generated a prompting guide for that. And just real briefly, prompts are essentially just how we interact with large language models, which are the primary form of generative AI that we're using today. And essentially, it's just the input that we put in. We're probably most familiar with chatbots where we're putting in text like you know, just writing a sentence or asking a question. But prompts can also be, can include multimedia, like images or other forms of data as well. But all they are is just our inputs. And you've probably been advertised a million prompting guides, and actually I'd recommend you might take a look at some of those because there's so many different approaches to prompting. It's actually a little bit more like spell casting <laughs> than in a science. We are in an alchemical period right now. I think someone earlier at the, at the prompting workshop yesterday uh, mentioned that there was a study recently in which researchers looked to try to um, determine what's the best prompt for a specific task. So they had a task, they generated 50 different prompts for it, and then they rated the effectiveness of all the responses. And the number one uh, most successful prompt began with the words, take a deep breath. Let's just think through this step by step. All right? Not what you would expect from a computer. We have to develop new intuitions. Anyway, there's no right or wrong way to prompt, but here's some general things to consider. So first of all, you need to provide framing. These are general purpose, most of these chatbots are general purpose chatbots. They're trained on everything from astrophysics to Shakespeare, right? So you need to focus it in on the area of the neural net that you really want it to mine. It's very useful oops, to assign the LLM a voice to really give it as much information about what your goals are, to specify your context, and give examples. Machine learning systems love examples. So if you have an example of a good response, tell it. Next, engage deeply. The, probably the number one mistake people make when trying to use a, a large language model or chatbot for the first time is that they ask one question and they're like, oh, that sucked. And then they say, it's, it's, oh, those is, that's just dumb. Well, just like a real human conversation, you have to engage in order to get anywhere, right? So be iterative, explorative, expand, and contract your focus. Your job as the human being in this interaction is to question and nudge the bot. Move it towards the area you want it to get to. Tell it when it's not doing what you need. And, you're, and also, it doesn't know what a good idea is. That's your job. The other thing is, you know, these, these bots, you know, we, we sometimes think of them as an entity, we call them a Claude or ChatGPT. They're actually not one entity, they're a multitude of entities. And so you can actually explore possibilities and explore multiple points of view, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. And you can also use it to make plans and then interrogate your own plans as well. I'll demonstrate that as well. And again, this is your collaboration. You're needing to work the human AI team. So you, the, 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 the goal here is to challenge each other's assumptions. If you don't understand what the, what the answer is getting, ask it to explain its process. You know, and you know, you can, if you don't like its process, suggest alternative processes. Say, no, try it this way or th that way. You know, and, and if you get stuck, you can also say like, hey, I'm having a hard time figuring this out. Can you suggest? three different ways we could proceed in trying to solve this problem. Be surprised with the ways it's going to expand your thinking about the problem space. 
Okay, so these are the five high-level steps to the framework. To step one, we're gonna frame the conversation, we're gonna explore some forecasts, we're gonna create some scenarios, we're gonna develop, show it about developing strategies, and then reframe the forecast. Why are you doing this forecasting? Who are you gonna be presenting it to? You, know, you can explore endlessly, but what's your goal here? Who's your audience? That kind of thing. Um, and before I show this demo, let me just say, that, imagine this like a cooking show, right? I'm gonna rush through this. In real life, you would take a lot of time. IFTF, typically, if we're doing a big forecast, we're taking six to 18 months to do this. I'm gonna show you in three minutes. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you, the tool that we use in our class, and I really recommend folks check out, is, uh, is it, uh, something called po.com. And the reason we like it is, is because it's not a chat bot, it's all of the chat bots. And you can get a free account and use in limited amounts, uh, but you can try all the, chat, uh, all the different models, everything from you know, Gemini um, and, and even the open source models like Llama and, and Mixtral, and it even has image generators that you can use for free. Uh, if you can pay $20 a month and get extended access. And I know that's been a question like, okay, is my data being used? Remember, what, we, what did we learn from social media? When it's free, you're the product. In this case, your data is the product. So in general, when you pay, they're not training on your data. And when you don't pay, you're contributing your data. But anyway, so we're gonna use Poe, and I actually, we're gonna use the Claude Instant Model. It's the model from Anthropic. It's really useful to just experience the different models and see what their strengths and weaknesses are and, and the kind of their flavor and character even. But we're gonna use Claude, which we like to use, um, I like to use it a lot, and we're gonna use a version called Instant, which is kind of a fast and cheap model. Um, even, in, it ha they have much more powerful models, but this one you can, for free, you, I think you get 100 questions a day on it. Oh, yeah, that's, we're gonna use Claude Instant. Okay, so I'm gonna step through, just really quickly, our step one is frame your con conversation, uh, conversation. We're gonna assign a role and goals for the bot and choose a future topic. And in the class, by the way, th this is from our class, we, we use the, the bots to explore a topic of your choice. So, so we ask people to pick a future topic. I get a little meta, I'm gonna have it explore generative AI. So my prompt is just something like, you're an expert futurist that helps humans consider a wide range of possible futures by exploring provocative long-term forecasts and speculative scenarios 10 years in the future. Futures topic today we're starting with is generative AI. Boom. And right off the bat, they're, you know, these things are trained to be helpful assistants, so they're gonna just try to respond to that right off the bat. But it's gonna be very generic, right? So we've kind of stated, we've framed our conversation, let's get in a little bit more, let's focused. Let's explore some specific forecasts. So here I am nudging it, right? And I'm gonna say, can you generate some more ideas about education? Because I wanna look at the intersection of generative AI and education. Now notice I didn't say generative AI and education. That's because the chatbots have contextual memory. It's just like a conversation with a real human being. You're building up context. That's a very powerful thing, right? It's like if you have to like get your entire question into one exchange, it's very difficult, but you build up context. But also like a human being, they do forget, right? And so you sometimes have to remind it. Anyway, so right off the bat, we get some ideas, and this is where you would spend time actually reading through. Some of these are maybe not great ideas. You might need to nudge it and say, those are not very interesting, or I want to focus more on this or that. The thing that really stuck out to me was this idea of teacher augmentation. So I said, okay, let's nudge it a little bit more on that. Say more about teacher augmentation. And we get a bunch of different, you know, different forecasts around that. Okay, you could, again, that could be a long, deep rabbit hole. But let's jump to step three, just for demonstration purposes. So let's generate some scenarios, some stories around this future. So let's say, write a scenario about an augmented teacher. And then boom, we get us a quick scenario. Maria is a middle school math teacher in 2032. Her school has provided her an AI teaching assistant named Carl to help her with planning and grading and other tasks. Before each unit, Carl generates a set of pre-made lesson plans based on the curriculum. While these plans aim to meet the student's needs, Maria finds that Carl, the AI, doesn't always get the nuances of her diverse group of learners. She ends up modifying about half of the AI's plans. Now, right, see right away, as soon as we jumped into a scenario, we're getting much more nuance on this, right? So, 
I, I really thought that was a provocative idea. So I said, okay, let's explore that. Say more about the types of nuances that the AI might miss. Boom, things like individual interest levels, prior knowledge and misconceptions. The one I thought was interesting, social and emotional needs. So let's simulate some multiple points of view. And a big part of our work, and we talk a lot about stories, you know, really what we're doing is world building. And world building is a collections of stories that interleave. So let's simulate multiple points of view in this world beyond that. Let's write a diary entry from a high school student who had some social emotional needs that an AI teacher's assistant missed and how the human teacher intervened. Boom, we get a diary entry. But let's not step there, stop there, let's do multiple points of view. Let's write a scene between two teachers who have AI introduced in their classrooms. One has been surprised how well it's worked, the other has had many frustrating problems. Boom, we get a, a scene, and actually reintroduced Maria from our previous conversation. But let's keep going. Let's ask for another point of view. Write a memo from a, president, a principal to their teachers where they grapple with the challenges and benefits of AI in the classroom. And boom, we get that. So now we're seeing an administrator's point of view in that world. So you can see we're world building from here. You could go very deep into, uh, into the scenarios. Let's jump to st step four, developing strategies. Let's generate and explore some possible action plans. So my prompt is, what could be a five-point action plan for a school looking to integrate AI over the next 10 years? Boom, we get that in probably under five seconds. I do not recommend copying and pasting this as your action plan, right? But you might be surprised with how good it can be. And you might be surprised with how bad it can be. Your job is to read and to determine that, right? And to look through that. But you can also use the, the chatbot to help you explore that. You could say, Let's, what are some potential unintended outcomes of the plan? Boom. So we're building up these contexts, right? It's drawing from, if I just started with like develop a, a, an action plan, started from there, it wouldn't have drawn from all the, co the context that we had built up. So let's now take those plan, the problems of the plan, and let's define some principles that would help ensure preferred outcomes for this future. And we get some, some ideas here around principles of human-centered design or accountability or inclusiveness. Okay, just getting through the last step, step five, reframing the forecast. You can endlessly explore, and I encourage you to do that, but especially if you know, you're working as I do for, on a project, you have to produce something. So you have to think about you know, what, who's my audience, what's the, what's the goal I'm trying to do, um, and what are the different ways I might tell this story. One of our favorite formats at IFTF is something we call Headline the Future. So let's write a news article from the future. So I could say, write a news story from 2033 about this school successively pursuing this plan, the challenges they faced, the insights they gained in the process, include surprising details and twists. That's my little tip to you. Always put include surprising details and twists to get it a little less generic. And quotes from stakeholders and experts. Start with a pithy headline that will grab readers' attention. Boom, we get a story. Uh, an article, how one school learned to leverage AI to augment, not replace great teaching. I'm not sure how pithy that is, but literally you could just say, make it more pithy. Um, another thing I often like to do is just, you know, take a more poetic view of the, 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 the exploration that we've done. So you'd be surprised how much you can get out of a poem or a song or even a rap song out of what you've been exploring. And then for a bonus, these large language models are becoming multimodal. So they don't just generate text, they generate images, now uh, videos, even so whole songs now. So, um, and Poe includes a couple image generators you can use, Stable Diffusion and Dali. So you could just say something like, a futuristic classroom, AI bot, augmenting human teachers and students, and get an image. That's not the best prompt, but you can play with it more. Anyway, that's the five steps. And I'm not proposing this is the only way to use these bots or use them for future forecasting, but I'm trying to show you that using a structured approach can have very different results than just kind of a couple questions to these bots. So as I mentioned, these are from our, our class. If you want to sign up, you can go to our website. But I just wanted to end just to say, just to more at a personal note, I feel like you know, generative AI, it's not just a technology. And you know, there's an existential kind of 
dread that a lot of people have around this. It's easy to feel like we're just like, we have to adapt to being inside of this machine. And I like to say that we need to rethink. I've, I've even heard you know, the, 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 the idea, we need to keep humans in the loop. I think we need to go beyond that and think of this, how do we introduce this technology within human systems? It's a slightly different framing, but I think really important. And especially within this room, I think, how do we introduce this technology within our planetary system, not just human systems, but the planetary systems that we're working on. So last thing I wanted to leave you with is a book recommendation. This is my favorite book, period, but it's specifically about AI and how we might integrate more than human intelligence into future AI systems. It's by James Bridle. Uh, it's, this, it's called Ways of Being, Animals, Plants, Machines in Search of Planetary Intelligence. It's not only some brilliant ideas, but it's an incredible history of our efforts to make, quote unquote, artificial intelligence and how flawed it's been, um, as well as incredible stories about understanding um, more than human intelligence. Uh, yeah, the quote from that is, we must learn to live with the world rather than to seek dom to dominate it. In short, we must discover an ecology of technology. You can check us out at IFTF if you want to come. If you want to connect with me, I'm the only Toshi Andrew Two on LinkedIn. And I also run a, f a Facebook group, if that's your jam, called Future Curious Tracking Signals of Change. And yeah, thank you for your time, and I'm so grateful to be here.